Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. I'm so glad to see your smiling faces in the house of God. Why don't you stand to your feet? I'm going to lift up the name of Jesus today. Come on. If you feel comfortable, come on. Put your hands together. the lamp unto my feet. Your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to life, and I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy's wide, because you're good on your promise. Come on. I'll take you at your word If you say
They say these chains will never break But they don't know you like we do Cause there is power in your name Church, you believe that this morning? We've heard that there is no way through We've heard the tide will never change they haven't seen what you can do Cause there is power in your name So much power in your name Move the immovable Break the unbreakable God, we believe trust you, that we can lean on you. In every season of life, God, you hold us in the palm of your hand. We don't have to fear. We don't have to doubt. We don't have to stress because you've got us. You won't let us slip. You won't let us fall. Let's sing these words together. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. How many believe that?
that the Lord never fails, amen? Life fails us, people fail us, but God never fails. Be encouraged this morning that God's got you. Can we sing that one more time together? Oh, your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've to forget all of the great things you did when did I throw away faith for the impossible how did I start to believe that you weren't sufficient for me why do I Talk myself out of seeing miracles. Come on, sing it out. When you are more than able, yes, you are. And you are more than able, yes, you are. You are more.
time And you are more than is so good. There is no better place than to be together in the house of the Lord. Welcome to Cornerstone, everyone. My name is Grant. I get to be a high school pastor here. On behalf of our staff and all of our incredible difference makers, I am so glad that you decided to join us today. Special shout out to those of you who are watching us online. I'm so glad you're hanging out with us as well. Everything we do today exists that you might take a next step in your journey of faith, whether you're new to Cornerstone, new to this whole church thing, or new to figuring out who Jesus is, or you've been here for a while and you're just trying to become more like Christ, wherever you are, we want to make that next step as easy as possible. And so if you are new, if you just text the word new to 21999, we would love to get connected with you. Or you can meet us in the lobby after service. We've got a gift there waiting for you, and we would love to meet you in person. Now, for all of you who are in the room right now, I would love to invite you to our Saturday night service. That service is designed with the family in mind to develop a unique community where we hang out after service, get to know one another, and we would love for you to join us and be a part of it. A really cool part of that service is there's food there. For $5 a person, you can feed your whole family, and we would love to invite you to be a part of it. We also wanna let you know that for Saturdays, this summer, we're only meeting at our 4 p.m. service time. So I just wanna make sure that you are aware of that. I don't know if you've noticed it yet, but it's summer. And as someone who recently moved here in the last three years, I've noticed, I know it's summer here when all the HVAC companies have their vans all across the 202, because you're all figuring out you need some AC repairs, all right? But for me, when it's summer, that means it's camp season. And I'm super excited to tell you all about Kids Camp. Kids Camp is for our four-year-olds through fourth graders. So if you have a current third grader as of next week, they're a fourth grader. So that's included in that age gap. Kids Camp is everything that VBS for you as a kid wished it was. It's incredible and high energy and fun. And it creates a space for your kids and their friends to develop a foundational faith. If you want to learn more about Kids Camp, text Kids Camp to 21999, all Ks. And then out on the patio, there's a booth of incredible kids workers who would love to meet you, answer any questions that you have. Now, our ability to do incredible ministry to help equip and prepare the next generation for a life where they love and walk like Jesus has been part possible because so many of you have chosen to honor God with your finances. And so thank you. Thank you on behalf of all the kids in our children's building. Thank you on behalf of every single young person who's grown up on this church and grown up in this church and gone on to do ministry. Thank you. And if you're looking to begin to honor God in that way or begin a journey of generosity, you can do that by texting GIVE to 21999. Now, there's a couple other camps I wanna tell you about that I think are pretty fantastic. Our fifth grade day camp and our junior high camp, which is sixth through eighth grade, is in the beginning of June. And uh, those junior high students are going to Glorieta, New Mexico to this incredible camp in the mountains. And then our high school camp is over in Southern California at Biola, and that's June 19th through the 24th. Camp is where God changes everything. Like, I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for camp when I was in high school. Camp, my freshman year is where I said yes to Jesus. Sophomore year is where I figured out how to forgive my dad. And junior year is where God called me into ministry. Like, camp is where God changes everything. And I just want you to think about it, like from my perspective as the youth pastor here. Your student will spend over 600 hours a year in extracurricular activities. It's predominantly sports, but there's other things that they love to do and you love to chauffeur them around. Um, but the average student in Chandler that goes to church regularly will spend 25 hours a year in church. There's a huge discrepancy there, mom, dad, grandparents. 
guardians. 600, verse 25. Camp hits almost 75 hours of time spent with people who want them to find and grow in a personal relationship with Jesus. You just tripled the annual amount. With camp, we're at 100 hours. Like it's a perspective thing. And as much as I love all the other things that our kids do, I love to go to their games and to hear about their choir concerts. Those are incredible, but I can't wait to spend eternity with them, not just go to their games. And so whether it's kids camp, or it's high school or junior high camp, whatever it is, I need you to invest in an eternity with your child as much as we're investing in all the fun things that they love to do. So to learn more about camp, text CAMP to 21999. Go ahead and check out this video. How we doing? Super, super glad that you're here. This is the final Sunday we're having our conversation about stress. My hope is this, that this Sunday, above all the rest of the conversations, will be the most practical for you, maybe even the most insightful for you and helpful for you. If, if we're just honest, there's, there's moments in our life that it feels like we're standing in the surf, and, and there is just wave after wave after wave of trouble and problems coming our direction. And in that moment, you and I pray and we say, hey God, would you take these problems out of my life? Would you remove this from me? It's unfair, it's unjust, I didn't, would you do something about the things that are discouraging me, the things that are causing stress in my life, would you just take them away? Sometimes he does. Sometimes he doesn't. And it's in those moments that he doesn't that you and I become most frustrated, most discouraged with God because what we want to say is, hey, God, wait a minute. I did my part. I prayed about this thing. That's what you told me to do. And then your part is to take the problem away. I'm convinced that there are moments that God invites you and me into the surf to actually navigate the waves, that on purpose he does not take the waves away because he wanted you and me to experience the waves. Think about this. If God is truly in control, if God is all-powerful, if God is all-knowing, and he allowed that wave into my life, that problem, that struggle, that unfairness into my life, the thing that we get most stressed about, and we've prayed about it and he hasn't taken it away, is it possible that he wanted you and me to experience the wave, to learn from the wave, to overcome the wave? 
And I'm convinced that one of the reasons that you and I struggle so much with this is because we have invitation confusion. We thought God invited us to pray and he would solve it. He invited us to live in it. Think about this. I want you to imagine that you've got a friend and they invite you to go surfing with them. They say, hey, tomorrow morning I'm going surfing. Join me at the beach, 7 a.m. I'll teach you everything there is to know about surfing. You show up. Uh, your friend is there. There's amazing waves. Uh, your friend walks you out into the water. You get to about neck deep. And now the waves coming in are crashing over the top of you. You're swallowing ocean water, which is horrifying. No one has any idea what those fish have done in that water. And in that moment, your friend says to you, hey, where's your surfboard? And you pull out a pillow. And he goes, wait, 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 wait. Where's your surfboard? We're going surfing. And you go, oh, I must have misunderstood your invitation. I thought we were going to come to the beach and watch other people surf. I thought we were going to lay in a hammock and just have a comfortable, lazy day. I brought my pillow so that it would be extra soft. And your friend says, no. I invited you to come serve because there is something remarkable. There's something amazing when you take the power of that wave and you actually learn how to use it to take you on the ride of your lifetime. And is it possible that God would bring into our lives problems, not in order to take them away, but in order to teach you and me to surf, how to live in that problem, harnessing that power, and actually go on the ride of our lifetimes, because we've mastered the wave. So here's what I'm gonna ask us to do. The next time, the next time you're in struggle, the next time you start feeling yourself getting stressed out, and you've prayed and God hasn't taken it away, I've created an acronym a letter picture that you can go down the list and say, hey God, why is it that you've asked me to live in the wave or live with the wave? What is it you're doing with me and the wave? And it actually spells the word surf. And you'll start at the top, you'll work to the bottom, and chances are you'll figure out in that process, oh, I totally understand what God is doing and now I can learn to get on my surfboard and surf. So the first letter is S, S. Sometimes when I'm facing waves, when I've got problems going on in my life, it's an S moment. It's actually a spanking from the Lord. No, no, this is true. Because there are some moments in which I'm living that moment in disobedience. God spoke to me. He said, hey, I want you to deal with your anger. And you went, nah. I'm kind of enjoying my anger. Uh, God said to you, hey, I want you to forgive this person who hurt you in your life. And you said, no, 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 no. I'm finding so much joy in my bitterness toward them. No, I'm not going to do it. And we've resisted what God is trying to do in our lives. And you understand that when you resist, then it leaves it to God to have to up the ante Say, hey, we had a conversation about this. You weren't willing to hear the conversation. Now I have to bring discipline in your life. Matter of fact, grab your Bibles because it talks about this very moment. It's Hebrews chapter 12. And if you're not familiar, go to the back of your Bible, start working to the left. You'll find this book of Hebrews. It's almost at the back of your Bible. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, starting in verse 5. Here's what it says about the moment in which you and I press God into disciplining us, bringing struggles into our life, bringing problems that are intended to get our intention. See, it's self-imposed. Here's what it says, Hebrews chapter 12, verse five. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement? No, 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 Lynn, we're talking about spankings. There's nothing about a spanking that's encouraging. Hang on. You have completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. 
You get what he's saying? The, the reason God is bringing discipline in your life, the reason God is spanking you, is because he recognizes you as one of his children. If you weren't one of his children, he wouldn't be spanking. Because you ready for this? Because God doesn't spank the neighbor kids. I mean, how, how many times have you seen somebody who has no regard for God, they're living their life in incredible recklessness, and you go, God, why aren't you spanking the poop out of them? Why are you so focused on me? Probably because they're not a child of God. But once you become a child, then correction becomes important. Let's go back to the passage. Verse 7 says, endure hardship. Endure the waves. Endure the things that feel unjust. Endure the things that seem hard in your life. Because endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as a child, as children, for what child is not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not a legitimate, you're not true sons and daughters at all. And then jump down to verse 11, it says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. Amen. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. I guarantee you in this room right now, if I said, okay, worst spanking you ever got, it immediately came to mind. You went, oh, I remember that one. Matter of fact, you probably remember what you did to get the spanking. And chances are, after that, you went, ain't never doing that again. Because the pleasure of my disobedience was nothing compared to the unpleasantness of my discipline. It's what happens. And here's two things you need to know when God is disciplining. Number one is this. God's going to win. God's going to win. You have never met the human being who has outsmarted, outlasted, outwit God. God's going to win. The only question at stake, if this is discipline, if that's what's happening when these waves, if that's God disciplining you, the only question left on the table is simply this. How much pain do you want to endure? before you relent, because he will win. Lisa, years ago, was uh, driving in the car with our son Joshua. He was about four at the time. He's in the back seat, he's whining about everything. He's complaining about everything. Uh, he's getting really, really sassy with Lisa. Doesn't want to eat what they're gonna have for lunch, doesn't want to go where they're gonna go. Finally, Lisa turns and says to Joshua, Josh, you've got an attitude problem. Are you going to fix it, or am I? To which Josh replied, you! Lisa pulled the car over to the side of the road, walked to that back door, and she applied the hand of knowledge to the seat of Joshua's understanding. And I'm just going to tell you, you want to know something? Joshua never said, you, again. Never. And you understand what's happening in the moment. See, it started as a discussion. Hey, Josh, we're having a bad attitude. And some of us right now are in the middle of a discussion with God. God's saying, hey, I need you to work on this anger thing you've got. I need you to work on how you're treating your spouse right now. Because I know, I know, I know you feel like they deserve it, but it's not what Jesus would do with his spouse. And I need you to deal with this. Don't let the answer be you. You deal with it. You fix it. Because here's the answer. God always wins when it comes to discipline. Here's the second thing you need to know about discipline. Don't be surprised if the place that he spanks you isn't the location of your disobedience. I'm going to say it again. Because we get so confused on this. Don't be surprised if the place that Jesus spanks you, that God spanks you, isn't the same location as the disobedience. Imagine this for a moment. Imagine you've got a 13-year-old daughter, and she just decides she's having so much fun talking to her friends, texting her friends, Snapchatting with her friends. She's not going to do any homework. And for a week, she doesn't do any homework assignments. You get a letter from her teacher that says, hey, just thought you ought to know, every night this week we've had a homework assignment. Your daughter hasn't done a single one. You go to your daughter and you say, is this true? And she says, yes. Why didn't you do your homework? I didn't want to. And then your answer is, okay, 
for a week, you don't have your cell phone. To which she says, unfair. My problem where I disobeyed was with school. So what you ought to do is ground me for a week from school. <laughs> Every parent worth their salt says, hey, I'm not going to address you where you were. I'm going to address you with something that gets your attention. And it may have nothing to do with the area in which you were disobedient. Which is why when you're resisting God and you're saying, God, no. I'm not going to do anything about my language. I don't care if it hurts and wounds and offends others. And God hits you in your finances. God is not constrained to discipline you where you're disobeying. He will discipline you where it gets your attention. So, when the waves are coming, when all of a sudden life is unfair, when, when God doesn't seem to be answering your prayer and taking the problem away, the first thing you do is you begin to pray and you say, hey, God, is this a spanking? Have I got a place in my life that I'm living in disobedience, a place you've been asking me to address that I've been ignoring and saying no? And if God moves on your heart, if the Holy Spirit says, well, yeah, we've been talking about anger for months now. Yes, I've been talking to you about what you watch and what you put in your mind. Here's how you serve. You surrender. You surrender. You just say, God, I'm done arguing. I'm done fighting you over this. I don't want you to pull over the car. I'm done. And you surrender. And it's interesting. When the child learns the lesson, the discipline can go away. But let's say... You go through the first step. In other words, the problem's there. God hasn't taken it away. You prayed. You said, God, is this, is this a spanking because it's an area of disobedience and God doesn't show you anything? You go, no, I think I passed that one. So now you go to the U in surf. And the U is university. Because it is possible that God has enrolled you in a class. God is about to teach you something in the midst of the problem that you can't possibly learn without going through the problem. You understand that, right? There are certain things you can't learn by watching it on TV or reading it in a book. You have to actually experience it in order to learn it. For example, how do you learn faith if you've never been afraid? How do you learn to trust God in a moment like that if trusting God wasn't terrifying? How do you learn generosity unless there's been a moment in which God has spoken to your heart about doing something that just stretched you beyond anything you would have ever thought you would do generously? How do you learn about compassion if you've never had the moment of helping somebody who needed a hand up? How do you learn about patience if God's never brought someone in your life who drove you crazy? You've been wondering why you had Uncle Tom in your family. Patience. Because there's things, you ready guys? There are things that you cannot learn without doing them, living them. Matter of fact, grab your Bibles and go with me to the book of James. It's gonna be just a little bit to the right of where we were in Hebrews if you have a physical Bible. James chapter 1, James chapter 1, starting in verse 2, here's what it says. Consider it pure joy. Notice he doesn't say, hey, be joyful. He says, put this in the joy box because God is actually teaching you something that you need to learn. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, when the waves are hitting and you've prayed and God's not taking it away, understand this may be you've been enrolled in a class. When you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. See, there's the possibility when God allows problems, he doesn't take them away. When I want him to take them away, it's because he's teaching me something that I cannot learn without living that moment. I've got a dear friend, his name is Bill, and 
Bill and his wife, they bought a house, had a pool in the backyard, which immediately put them in a moment in which he said, hey, I've got to make sure that my kids know how to swim because the last thing I want to have happen is they go out in the backyard and we don't see them or, or they fall in the pool and nobody knows and they need to know how to swim. So he enrolled both of his kids into swimming lessons, his son and his daughter. His daughter caught on right away. His son refused to learn. He was terrified to be in the water and so he would cling on the edge of the pool. They enrolled him in two swimming classes, and then finally, out of desperation, brought a tutor to the house to teach their son how to swim. He refused. He had to hold on to the side the entire time. So one day, Bill goes to his son and says, all right, look, I know, I know you're terrified, I know you're afraid, I can get you over the fear in two minutes. His son said, really? Bill said, yeah. Give me two minutes, I'll get you over the fear. His son said, okay. Bill promptly picked up his son, threw him in the deep end of the pool. As he was flying through the air toward the open water, he let out the world's most blood-curdling scream. This caused his mom to come out, who promptly said to Bill, what are you doing to our son? And he said, I'm teaching him to swim. She said, he could drown. And Bill looked at her and said, I'm right here. He's not in danger. You realize there's moments like that, right? Where God says, you can't learn this without doing this. And he has tossed you and me into the deep end of the pool to learn how to swim. And he was standing on the edge the whole time. You and I were never in danger despite our screams. It's interesting because Bill's son swam to the edge of the pool, grabbed the side, looked up his mom and said, did you see me swim? From that moment on, they could not get that boy out of the pool. Because, guys, sometimes there's things that you and I can only learn in the deep end of the pool. And so God invites the waves. He lets the troubles and the struggles come into our lives. Because he's enrolled us in the class. How do you handle this? How do you navigate this moment? You go back to prayer. You say, God, are you trying to teach me something? And if the Holy Spirit says, well, yeah, I'm trying to help you with that anger issue you've got in your life. I'm trying to teach you to be more compassionate to that lowly worker at your office that nobody else cares for. And I'm trying to teach you to care for them. And if God speaks your heart and says, yes, this is a lesson, this wave that you don't, this wave is a lesson, then the best thing you can do is decide to truly be a student. In my early years of going to school, I didn't take school very serious. I made sure I got good enough, good enough grades. When I finally went off to seminary, I, something clicked in my heart and I said, I'm going to be a student for the first time. I ended up graduating seminary with high honors. Wouldn't it be incredible if you and I took the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach us, that God is trying to instill in our hearts, and if we graduated the class with high honors? There may be the moment you say, Lynn, I, I looked into it, I prayed, I said, God, is this a spanking? God didn't bring anything to my heart or mind to convict me. I said, God, is this a university? Have you enrolled me in a class? And it didn't seem that way. I didn't. So if it's not the S and it's not the U, then maybe it's the R. And the R stands for redeeming. Redeeming. You understand that you and I have a God who never wastes pain. Let me say this again because this is big. You and I serve a God who never wastes pain. He's not like some little boy pulling the legs off a cockroach. He never invites you and me into pain simply to watch us have pain. He always redeems the pain. Matter of fact, grab your Bibles real quick and go with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter one, starting in verse three, 
here's what he says that God does to redeem the things we struggle through. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 3, it says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comforts, who comforts us in our troubles. Do you notice? didn't say, hey, he plucked me out of the trouble, set me on the beach. No, 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 no. He comforted me in the trouble, in the struggle, in the unfairness. Who comforts me in all of our troubles so that we, you ready? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. It says, hey, look, sometimes God will allow things to happen in your life. He'll allow you and I to go through it so that in the going through it, and as we figure out, hey, here's how I depended on God, here's how I navigated those circumstances, that out of that, I could then bless somebody else's life with what I learned in the trouble. It actually becomes my ministry. I minister from the redeeming work of God in my life. Now, here's what you need to know. There's two sides to this redemption. Sometimes the trouble that I'm in, the struggles I go through, I impose them on myself. In other words, I got involved in something I shouldn't have gotten involved in. I got addicted to something. I, I behaved in a way and I lost my marriage, whatever. The, but I self-imposed that struggle. And yet, here's the wonder of it, guys, that even in our self-made mess, there's a God who redeems that, who says, if you'll let me help you and walk you through this, as we navigate this together, the knowledge you'll come out with, the understanding you'll have, you'll be able to help somebody else who is in the same circumstance. This struggle can become your ministry there's another side to that coin. There's some stuff that comes into my life I had nothing to do. I did, it wasn't of my making. Uh, this, is, this is, why did I get a special needs child? Uh, why did I lose my job? Why did I get laid off? I was one of the best employees at where I work. Why, why am I struggling financially right now? And in the midst of that, God says, as you found me, as you navigated this with me, as you experienced my comfort in your life, this can then be the comfort that you minister to someone else. So I'm about 20 years old. I'm an intern. And uh, I, we end up going on a ski trip up to Sunrise. So we get there. Turns out, everybody else on the bus was an experienced skier. I was the only one who it was their first time. So when the bus parks, everybody grabs their ski lift pass, heads up the hill, I'm left by myself. I'm standing there, I walk up to a complete stranger, I said, look, this is, this is my first time skiing, what do I do? They pointed, they pointed over to a place that they called Bunny Hill. It should have never been named Bunny Hill. I'm pretty sure it should have been called Purgatory. There ain't no purgatory in the Bible, but there is a bunny hill. And I got up on bunny, and I'm just telling you, it was the most horrifying things. You move without moving your feet. Your legs go in the wrong directions. I was falling every three feet, and when I fell, my skis would come flying off, my poles would go sliding down the hill. In skiing, they call that a yard sale. It was absolutely humiliating because here I am. I'm 20 years old. Everybody else on Bunny Hill six, And they're mocking me. I spent the entire morning. I spent from 8 o'clock in the morning till noon on Bunny Hill. Trying to figure out for myself how to turn. How to ski. And it was horrible because no one was helping me. It was all self-taught through failure. By noontime, I finally got to ski my first green. When I got back on the bus and on the trip home, here's what I resolved in my heart. I will never let somebody else go through the pain and the discouragement that I had to go through because I was by myself. So literally from that day forward on every other ski trip, before we got to the lodge, I would walk the aisle in the bus and I'd say, how many of you, it's your first time? 
Everyone who raised their hand, I'd say, hey, when we get there, you find me. I'm going to take you to Bunny Hill. I'm going to teach you to ski within an hour. And guys, I'm going to tell you, I was glad and willing to give up my hour, knowing that nobody else had to go through what I had to go through as hard as I had to go through it. What had been my pain became my ministry. It's how God redeems. We've got a gentleman in the church. And his, his name is Bart Nolenberger. And when Bart was a young man at 14, he was introduced to alcohol and drugs. And it, became, it be, literally signaled the beginning of decades of addiction in his life. He was also introduced to pornography. And so he spent years and years looking at things that he shouldn't have been looking at that didn't have honor for him. Uh, he treated women in ways that he shouldn't have treated women. And then Jesus got a hold of his life and gave him freedom, led him to a place of being able to step out of all of that within his lifestyle. Today, uh, Bart Nolenberger has had 38 years of sobriety. He's been freed from his struggle in sexual purity. And about a year ago, Bart came to me and he said, Lynn, these have been my struggles. This is what has happened in my life and I've found freedom in that. We, we, don't, we don't have a single ministry like that at Cornerstone. And I said, Bart, no, we don't. I don't think we have anything like that. He said, but Lynn, I'm, I'm sure there's gotta be other people. There's gotta be a bunch of people who have the same struggle that I've had. And I said, Bart, you're probably right. He said, can I start something? You realize what was happening in that moment. Out of his pain, God redeemed, and it became his ministry. And if you walk out on the patio today, you're going to find Bart Nolenberger at a Celebrate Recovery booth, offering someone the chance to go on Bunny Hill and learn how to ski in an hour, what it took him half the day to do. Is it possible that what God is doing by inviting you into the waves, trying to teach you how to surf, is he's actually preparing you, redeeming the unfairness and the broken and the wrong in your life and giving you a ministry to others. So here's what you do. You pray and you say, God, is this thing, is, is this your guiding hand on me? Are you preparing me to help somebody else who's in the same circumstance I am. And if God says yes to your heart, then here's the deal. Then you gotta raise your hand and say, can I? Can I give my testimony? Can I join a ministry? Can I start a ministry like that? Can I? But let's say you go down the list. You start with S and you say, hey, I'm pretty sure it's not a spanking. I prayed about it. My heart was pure. I talked about, is this a class that I've been enrolled in? Did God put me in the university of life? And God didn't reveal to me anything he was trying to work on or teach with me. I asked, hey God, is this you preparing me? Is it you redeeming some of the brokenness in my life and preparing me for a ministry? And I, it wasn't. And then you move to F. And if you get to F, then here's the answer. It probably doesn't have anything to do with you. See, those waves and the unfairness or the wrongness of it, or the, it probably isn't about you. It's probably about someone else. It's probably about a friend who's in close enough proximity to you that if they could see you live that really, really tough moment of life and live it with faith, live it with peace, Watch you go through it and not freak out and not lose your mind and say, I, I don't understand it, I don't get it, but I'm trusting God for it. And that them seeing you navigate a moment that they couldn't even begin to navigate because they don't know your Jesus would say, I think I need your Jesus because I could never do what I just watched you do. Grab your Bibles. Go with me to the book of Matthew. Because Jesus is going to have this conversation and explain that sometimes, sometimes this is about you and me being light so that our friends can see. Matthew chapter 5. 
Again, if you're not familiar, go to the back of your Bible, work to the left. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, here's what it says. You, me, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Guess what God just said? Hey, there's moments. There's moments when someone's not figuring me out, when someone can't see me through the darkness. And I'm gonna take a lampstand, I'm gonna stick it right in the middle of the room, I'm gonna put so much light out there, they can't miss the light. Which may be why God gave you the job that he gave you. It may be why God put you in the neighborhood that he put you. He was putting a lampstand, and now he's allowed something to come into your life, something of unfairness, something that just looks like a massive, huge problem, so that you can live that moment so well that your friend, your neighbor, your coworker would see you live that moment. It's as if God put you in the spotlight and said, watch this. And now that neighbor, that friend, sees you navigate that moment in a way that they cannot comprehend, they can't understand how you could live that moment so well, and that they would be curious and say, could you tell me a little bit more about this Jesus that you serve? Because you have something in your life that I have none of in mine. Back to the passage. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others, ready? That they may see your good deeds, the way that you live that moment, and then glorify your Father in heaven. It's possible that God would bring a problem in your life that's not about your disobedience, it's not about anything you need to learn, it's not, he would bring a problem because he has so much confidence in you that you would live that problem so well that people around you would be amazed at how well you served. How, how many of you know who Malinga is? Okay, looks like maybe a third. All right, let me tell you the Malinga story. So Malinga was a sophomore in Bible college. They go on break. While he goes on break, there's a man from Tanzania who comes to Malinga and says, hey, in my home country of Tanzania, I know lots of pastors and lots of churches. I can set it up so that you can speak in them. If you're a sophomore in Bible college and someone tells you, I can set you up to speak in a lot of churches, you jump in their car. So that's exactly what Malinga did. He jumped in the car with this man and they head off towards Tanzania. As they get to the border, the border patrol begins to inspect the car. Turns out the man he's with is actually a smuggler. He thought if he invited a pastor, then maybe the border patrol wouldn't look so closely at his car. And now both the smuggler and Malinga are thrown in prison. It's a prison that was built for 1,100. There's over 3,300 men in the prison. Long gone are the beds and the blankets. Everybody sleeps on the ground shoulder to shoulder to shoulder to shoulder because the prison's not overcrowded. The man, the smuggler, decided he doesn't want to live this way, so he bribed some of the guards to give him drugs so that he could commit suicide. Unfortunately or fortunately, the drugs don't work, but they put him in a comatose state. So now there he is laying on the ground, writhing there and moaning, but he can't do anything for himself. He can't go to the bathroom for himself. He can't get in line to go get food for himself. And Malinga decides to care for the man who got him unjustly placed in prison. Now think about what that means. He can't go to the bathroom by himself and Malinga is bathing him. He can't go stand in the food line, so he, Malinga takes his bowl, stands in the line of 3,300 men, gets the food, comes back, feeds the man, then picks up his own plate and goes back, and by now the food is all gone. He ate nearly nothing for those two weeks. <clears throat> the prison guards come to Malinga and they say, Malinga, we're pretty confident that you're innocent. But now the conversation in the break room is, maybe not, because they see you taking care of this man and they're deciding, maybe he really is your friend, and so now you're looking guilty Malinga, you got to stop taking care of him. To which Malinga answered, I can't. Because my Jesus would have cared for the man who got him unjustly placed in prison. 
and I can do no less. When the man finally recovered, he still didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus, didn't care about God, didn't repent because of Malinga's kindness. But you know what did happen? A whole bunch of prisoners saw how Malinga treated that man. And Malinga decided to start church services in prison. Now here's the deal. If you're in Tanzanian prison, there's not much to watch on TV because there is no TV. And so as Malinga began to do church services, the inmates said, well, there's nothing else to do. Let's go to church every day. And by the time Malinga had spent two years in prison for something that had nothing, he didn't do it. It wasn't his problem. He, he didn't cause it. It was God placing him in a place to show light to men around him. And by the time the two years were finished, over 2,000 criminals made a first-time decision for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Think about the honor of that. The honor that if God would come to you and me and say, I've got a problem I want you to live, and I have so much confidence that you'll live this like Jesus, and that the people around you will see Jesus all over you in the midst of this problem, I'm going to give you that assignment. Think of the honor that God would call you or me to that. And here's what I'm going to tell you. That if you find yourself on F, you begin to pray. Say, God, would you be kind enough to let me know who the friend is? Who is it whose attention you're trying to get? It would be a lot better if I knew. And then, and then you live that moment hanging ten. You make that the best ride you've ever had. You live that moment for God so wonderfully, so amazing that everybody stops seeing you and only sees Jesus on you. You and I have made a mistake. We didn't understand the invitation of God. We got frustrated because he wouldn't let us stay on the beach in the hammock with our pillow that instead he had invited us out into the waves to take the ride of our lives, to learn to surf, to handle problems in a way that nobody who doesn't know God can handle them. And some of us turned him down because we confused the invitation. And guys, I'm just telling you, the greatest privilege of your life is when God invites you to surf. Let's pray. Hey, dear Assembly Father, we're done being on the beach. We're, we're, we're done with the moments when we've asked, hey God, would you take this away and you don't answer, we're gonna stop the complaining. We're gonna grab our surfboards. We're gonna come out into the deep and we're gonna learn how to right our problems for the right of our lives. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this weekend. So glad that we got to have this conversation. If there's some areas in your life where you have a lot of stress and you would like prayer, text prayer to 21999 and someone will reach out to you and be there to pray for you. And hey, we want to see you next week. We want to keep the conversation going. So hey, let's commit to showing up next week. We'll see you there.